On this episode of the Impact Sessions, I'm absolutely delighted to have as my guest Katie Thompson. Katie is managing director of a company called Katie Lingo. Uh, I've known Katie for some time, and um, we've entitled this podcast "The Pen Is Mightier Than the Sword." So, first of all, Katie, first time ever as a podcast guest. Indeed, I'll be nice to you. Hopefully, thank um, you. <laughs> enjoy the podcast and welcome to the Impact Sessions. Thank you very much. It's been too long. It has been too long, but let's see if we can reacquaint ourselves, but also inspire some of the listeners with a, you know, a few ideas around um, kind of language and copyright and all those kind of uh, areas that people seem to get wrong when it comes to content. So sure. I've got a, a number of questions I'd like to run through and just gives a bit of structure, but let's just see where we go to, Katie. So okay. i say welcome to the Impact Sessions. Thanks. Let's start with your business, Katie Lingo. So obviously the lingo references about language. Mm-hmm. Um, so why do you think language is so important in terms of business communication, the actual language piece itself? Yeah, um, I mean, Katie Lingo in itself, uh, for starters, that was the only domain name available. So I just kind of went with it. Uh, I did a linguistics degree and I thought, well, that's memorable. And that's good. I'm going to rank for it. You know, no one else is called Katie Lingo as far as I'm aware. Well, what I would say is on, on the likes <laughs> of LinkedIn, you're easy to find. Uh, yeah. And, and, and memorable for some of your content. So I think yeah. Katie, Katie Lingo is a good shout. Yeah, yeah. You know, a bit of a blag there. But um, yeah, in terms of why, um, so are you just talking from sort of a marketing perspective yeah. or just in general? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, your brand, whatever you're putting out there, whether it's your website or a magazine or any kind of publication with the written word, that is your shop window, if Mm. you will. Um, So if I'm looking at your brand, I'm trying to get to know you. It's the first thing I see. If it's littered with spelling errors and grammar errors, um, you've immediately lost credibility with me um, Mm. from that first second. Um, And it makes me think, well, now... Um, you've lost my trust. Mm. Um, how can I trust you to provide your product or service if you don't pay, you know, attention to detail with spelling and grammar? So that's mm. one thing. Um, another thing I think is really important is tone of voice. Um, mm. It's really, an, it's really hard to infer tone um, over the written word. So you've got to really make sure that you hear that right. a lot, don't you? Yeah. You hear people saying. You know, I'm, I'm trying to create a brand and I'm trying to create... Uh, and a lot of people think brand is to do with, you know, the, the visual side of things yeah. and whatever. But I hear the phrase tone of voice mm-hmm. quite a lot. So what does tone yeah. of voice actually mean to a business? Then, what w- how would I find or see a tone of voice? What, what would be the, de- the demonstration of that? Um, I think it depends. First of all, you've really got to decide who your audience are. And I think a lot of people, there's almost a lack of self-awareness there, actually. right? Mm. Who are we and who are actually trying to talk to? Um, one agency that um, sort of I'm developing a bit of a relationship with now um, called Lazenby Brown in York. Oh, yeah. You may have heard of them. Uh-huh. They have really lovely um, kind of branding exercises when they first get a client in um they i think it's called like the 101 different personality types and there's all you know you could be a i don't know a warrior or whatever yeah. that may or may not be one don't quote me on yes, that yeah, yeah. um but it's all based on your sort of individual values um and not just you as a company but i think as you um you know what are you passionate about so um i think it's about making that come across and again looking to your audience and what kind of industry you're in like how formal does it need to be mm. is it a bit more chatty but um It's about getting that balance, I think. So it's about self-awareness as much as it is about understanding your customer as well. And you help people to find that tone of voice as part of Katie Lingo? Yeah, I think so. People people can get too inside their heads and they know exactly what it is they want (coughs) in here, but it's getting that across to other people. And hopefully that's the gap that I try to fill there. Okay. So talk about filling a gap then. Mm. Um, You obviously decided there was a gap in the market for you to to, to exploit as as setting the business up. Um, what was the catalyst for you doing that? Because you class yourself as a freelancer, mm-hmm. but I, I would class you as more than that. I think freelance, oh. I would, because I think freelance has a certain connotation, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But I think there's a you, there's an elevated professionalism about being different to a freelancer. And I think, right. you know, I, I would say from my experience and exposure to what you do, mm-hmm. it, there's an elevated sort of, it's not it's not just, a, you know, Katie in a back bedroom knocking a bit of content out. It, it feels a little bit more sort of, uh, <laughs> feels a little bit more <laughs> polished, if you like, than that. Thank so, you. So, um, 
so what was the reason for doing that, you know, in terms of setting the whole thing up? Which is quite a risk setting the business up from the start. Yeah, um, so it all started, I was working, um, so I've got a background, linguistics degree, and then I started out in magazines, very much sort of a journalism background. Um, and then as a postgrad, I did um, an NCTJ diploma, and that's the National Council for the Training of Journalists. Mm-hmm. So anyone who works sort of the nationals, they have to have a certain level of training within that. Right. So I did that as like a distance learning course while I was working at a digital marketing agency. Mm-hmm. So there... Um, and that was quite, um, you know, varied set of skills sort of SEO and PPC and every initialism you can think of, yeah. email marketing and all that sort of thing. Um, but my heart was in content. And um, so I was doing this on the side. And then once I got that qualification, you know, hours spent trying to learn shorthand and all that sort of stuff. Wow, so, still do that? Well, it, it there's well, a big debate about it on Twitter at the moment as to whether or not it's useful. And yeah. I would say it is, but I mean, God knows I... I can't even read my own handwriting. Let alone your shorthand handwriting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's twi- twice the difficulty there, isn't it? Yeah, um, but I thought, right, well, I've put all this effort into this. I need to do something with it. So mm. I just sort of, I started um, doing a little bit on the side, just kind of reaching out to people on LinkedIn. Do you need a little bit of help? And I think my first client was a wedding photographer, and I still work with him to this day. Wow. Love Moritz, if you're there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I started um, approaching agencies as well. And because I was working in agency myself, mm. I realised actually there is this need, beca- because, you know, it depends on the size of your agency, but you might have um, quite a small content team, and you never know when a huge project is just going to land in your lap. Mm. And... Um, you might need to outsource outsource that content. You never know, um, you know, you can't just put it all on one content person because I was that content person right, so in the agency. So you've got peaks, troughs, pressures, all that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, and, and it could just be even like really boring stuff. Like let's say you're doing a huge website migration project mm. and you've got to write a million meta descriptions for a million product pages or something like that. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah, so yeah. you outsource it. So I like to think that I'm kind of the invisible arm of an agency if you do need me okay, actually, can we call upon her at mm. nine o'clock at night? Not nine o'clock, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the thing is that the, in, in, in days gone by, there used to be full service agencies that mm. were full service agencies. There's less and less of those, aren't there? Mm. Because, the, because of the advent of, I guess, technology, freelance, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. A, a full service agency will purport to be a full service agency to their clients sure. and they'll project manage a whole raft of, of freelance providers for anything as yeah. part of that you know whether it's graphic or you know got a content delivery or video or whatever it might be so so there's a, obviously a niche there do you work extensively with agencies do you work with end clients what's your what's your balance of that um yeah it's it's grown a lot more into the agency side of things i do still work with some you know um small to medium sized enterprises like um for example i work for a um, someone who does like a password um, security management software mm-hmm. and I write her newsletters for her and she also has, has like a um, project collaboration tool so I do sort of newsletters for her um, I work for a luxury home technology supplier um, in Cheshire they're called Sona All right. they install like home cinemas and stuff like that oh so. wow footballer and stockbroker belt type oh thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh yeah. my goodness nice. yeah the homes are Look, amazing for those who are listening internationally Cheshire is the stockbroker belt of the northwest of England, where mm. um, a lot of the sort of footballers from the Liverpool and Manchester areas will live as well. So uh, affluent would be the word we use to describe Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and these yeah. houses, Nick, they're fabulous. They are something else. They're fabulous. <laughs> okay. Um, with content these days, I think everyone's aware that video is very powerful. Lots of people are exploiting YouTube. Uh, our own sort of podcast uh, is is fed through YouTube and into audio, etc. Mm. Um, but does language still play a part in in those kind of pieces of content, or is it just the visual impact? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I'm loath to say too many good things about video because I feel like it's going to put me out of a job. But no, uh, yeah, it's obviously rising in prominence a, a lot, um, and yeah. In terms of language, I would say you do have to change it quite a lot because, you know, the written word is so different from the spoken word. Mm. You probably have to simplify your language a lot and you probably have to think, well, um, you know, a lot of people have subtitles, um, so you don't want huge million syllable words or whatever. So um, I think you need to be a lot more conversational, a lot more sort of vernacular. Um, And yeah, um, not sure. (laughs) Just... Just, just be a bit, bit more w- yourself, I would say. Yeah, I just wouldn't if you're to... working 
this one if you work in that space at all mm. is it more the written content and the like the web content and the content for, yeah, for blogs and things I have done a little <laughs> bit of script work again for the wedding photographer because mm. uh, English wasn't his first language and um, because he does a lot of videography so he asked me to write a script for him yes. just as sort of an introductory video to his oh, website okay. so again it was quite weird just sort of writing like feel free to get in touch or whatever the yeah. sort of conversational so, way yeah it's sort of jaunty or whatever yeah <laughs> yeah okay well listen you mentioned it earlier and we've discussed it a number of times off air the frustration at the poor use of grammar mm. and punctuation spelling you've got a real bee in your bonnet as indeed i have <laughs> yeah, uh, about that you. so um apart from kind of grammar punctuation spelling which you still see um what else do you see that gets in the way of effective communication particularly written communication what are the things what, what are the things that people just get wrong um I mean, I think in terms of punctuation, maybe some people use ex- exclamation marks too often. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think that completely dilutes your message. It doesn't make you look very serious. And I, I think when I was studying that journalism course, it said it's like laughing at your own joke. Oh. Um, so, which is obviously not a good thing. Um, so that's just a, a little mini bugbear there. But so, I, is the exclamation mark an older version of the smiley emoji then? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. It's like, oh. hello, here I am. Come and take my goods, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Buy my wares. <laughs> Buy my goods, do whatever. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and I'm also, I'm just uh, sick of the sight of just regurgitated, regurgitated content, just seeing the same sort of like cliches just spouted all over LinkedIn. Um, There's lots of people, just as you say. Motivational <clears throat> quotes drive oh. me crazy. I don't want to do this to my audience who may be working in inverted commas motivational speaker land. Yeah, but sure. No, yeah. It's not your job to decide if you're motivational anyway. The mm-hmm. audience or the listener will decide if you're motivational. Yeah, it's the same yeah. with motivational quotes. They only motivate people if you want to be motivated by them. So to call them motivational quotes is, I think it's quite arrogant really. And, and yeah. the world's full of them. It's littered with them, isn't it? And I think there's nothing individual about them. You've seen them a million times in a, in a meme or whatever format. Mm. Journey of a thousand miles. Take the single step. Great. Oh, did, did, did you come up with that? Yeah. And, and also, how's that going to help me tomorrow to sell more eggs or yeah, whatever it might exactly. be? Yeah, exactly. So I would rather people were just um, you know, individual and just actually said they were thinking rather mm. than just trying to regurgitate something that somebody else has already said. There's a lot of stuff around these days about values, and I think one of those is authenticity, isn't it, really? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. really, really. So important. how do you help How would you help an organisation or a company or even a, a small business owner find that tone of voice and authenticity then? you know, Because a lot of people do feel that they have to follow this kind of well-trodden path don't they've mm. you know well everybody else is doing it so I do how do you help someone to find authenticity in that kind of uh, written side of things I think it's you know it's, it's obviously easy for me to say or find their USP or whatever but um a, a lot of businesses I'm working with now um they're very much focusing on sort of their local aspect um you know we, we are Yorkshire morning brand or whatever yeah yeah sorry I'm from the south in case yeah, <laughs> that, that, was the, that was the worst attempt at the Yorkshire accent I've ever heard was that was that more than or yeah, something really. I don't know it wasn't I'm even sorry. it wasn't even northern to be fair but um, well from good sorry effort. I apologize good effort <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so you know there's a, that kind of like a uh, local tone to things or something that makes unique you unique like if you have some inspiring story that made mm. you go into um your line of work mm. um I like a backstory, I must yeah, admit. Yeah, definitely. You know, I call it the business provenance, really. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Which I started off by asking you how you got into your business. Mm-hmm. And that's much more interesting in some respects than just regurgitating, you know, that I, I, I run a, a content business that helps with the written word. Well, yeah, that's the output. Yeah. But actually, what's the story? What how, how What's driven you to set this up? Yeah. So that authenticity is really important, I think. People have such incredible stories to tell as well. Mm. You know, they've gone through their trials and tribulations or whatever and got to where they are mm. today. Um, there are not many good storytellers out there, though, are there, to be fair? No, yeah, I think that, mm. that's the problem. That's why you need somebody to tell your story for you. Excellent, okay. <laughs> Let's go back to grammar, punctuation and spelling. And okay. at, at the risk of me sounding like a particularly old fart um (laughs) is the advent of text and emoji and other sort of shortened forms is that killing off our capacity to create sort of well-written well-constructed content there are two sort of schools of thought on this i would say there are those who'd say oh no you're being far too prescriptive you need to be open to um language evolution it's not um 
a decline. It's yeah, yeah. it's an evolution. You know, right. this is a new language. I mean, you see things like the word selfie entering the dictionary and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you could be old school and sort of say, no, absolutely not. This is this is killing the English language. Or mm. you could have a more open minded approach. Um, I wouldn't say it's killing it. I just think. Um, particularly with sort of Generation Zs or whatever, we need to teach people, okay, there is a time and place for emojis and text speak mm. or whatever. However, you still need to have those fundamental skills to get into the workplace or whatever and understand the basic principles of spelling and grammar because those are what are going to matter. Well, like you say, you've got to, cra- you've got to craft a piece of content. It's got to, mm. it's also got to look right, you know, so even, yeah. even, even, even sentence construction and, and, and where to put paragraphs and when, yeah. to, when to use bullets and, and yeah. the visual impact of the written word... Is that something you work with, you know, in terms of, of helping people to understand that side of things? Just how, you mean like how it How looks it visually on, looks on paper and the construction, yeah, the construction uh, of a, a, a blog or, a, um, you know, a white paper or mm. a piece of content. It also has to look appealing to make people to read it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does make a difference. <clears throat> I was reading a really interesting article the other day about actually how much design um, does have bearing on sort of how people process the text. And I think it was something called like the F shape, whereby like... A, all right. Like it's, when you write a sentence, it needs to be sort of a long sentence first, and then maybe like a bullet point, and then a shorter one to sort of um, with F or an E or something like that. And yeah. that's it was sort of describing how the eye kind of focuses and um, where we can drop off our attention mm. or drop off. So you need to sort of vary a little bit. So um, there's a lot of science to it. Um, yeah. And, you know, also for sort of SEO considerations as well. Okay, are you putting in your, your headings, your H2s, your H3s, and bullet points and stuff like that? Mm. And, Things like mobile considerations as well. Um, I was going to say you've got to look at you've got to look at sentence construction and layout for yeah. different devices, haven't you? Yeah, what, 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 I reckon ninety percent of, of content is being absorbed on mobile devices these mm-hmm. days. So yeah. if it's not mobile fit, it's not fit at all, is it? Yeah, and, and people don't have attention spans, so mm. um, you know. Don't get me on. <laughs> we'll be here all day, do, won't we? <laughs> do not get me on my old fart rant about attention spans. Oh, but anyway, no, no, mind. I get it. I never get mind. it. No, I know. Hey, listen. <laughs> Um, I know I like evolution and I think there's when you look at the Oxford English Dictionary every year they announce the sort of word of the, the, of the, mm. the last year and they announce which new words have come in and things like you know selfies etc yeah. yeah that is an evolution it's just how you use them and construct them into interesting content that's more yeah. important for me I think as a potential reader but then you know I'm getting older I'm not getting any younger and the younger generation probably don't have the attention span to read longer documents and longer you know, longer piece of content, really. Yeah, and you might find that their attention span is actually a lot longer if it's in print um, mm. than it is on a screen. You know, you'll get um, eye strain or whatever. So it, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. I would like to ask our audience, how many of you print out your emails to read them? Now, those of a certain generation will be smiling and admitting to themselves that they do that occasionally, okay? It's just a question, a rhetorical question for the audience because if you're reading it on an email <laughs> rather than reading it on a screen, do you get a different response? Anyway, that's all I just throw don't, what Don't throw. they say on the bottom of an email that you shouldn't print it? Exactly. Well, listen, we're going to have a lot of we're going to have a lot of uh, the environmental lobby <laughs> probably kicking off about it, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So, okay. Yeah. So, I'm interested in tips for our our listeners. Sure. Um so regarding the creation of a particularly well-crafted or interesting piece of content, so a blog particularly or, mm-hmm. you know, like I say, a white paper, yeah. um, what if you're not particularly skilled or natural at crafting that? How can they still be effective at creating some content? If, if you know, maybe English isn't their natural first language or maybe they're just not particularly educated to a you know, degree standard in, in English uh, language or mm-hmm. literature, they're not particularly that well well versed and well read sure can people still craft good content and what if so what do they need to be following well, call katie linger <laughs> no, i'm joking um so yeah i think there are a lot of ways you can approach it first of all um when you proofread everything never ever <laughs> publish anything if you haven't read through it even if it's an email i'll read it three times before yes. i send it because mm-hmm. the fear of getting something wrong too yes. much. Um, but also um, read it aloud. Print it off again. Mm. Sorry, trees. Um, print it off. Read it aloud. Actually listen to how it sounds because it can sound so different from how it looks on the page. Um, uh, actually, that's that's a really... I've never thought of that. Mm. Yeah, read it aloud. It, it, it does give it a different resonance, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you could use like a, a ma- machine to read it for you, but mm. it, there is no intonation in that or anything, so it's not quite the same. Um, but yeah, l- listen to it because you might find, oh, actually, that's a really... Really run on sentence, and I've completely lost my thread here. Mm. 
Um, another thing I use, um, it's an app called Hemingway Editor. Uh, right. It's really lovely. You just paste a big wall of text into there and it sort of gives you a score. Uh, and the lower the score, um, the better it is. Um, so it rates you on things like it doesn't like um, the passive voice. It doesn't like adverbs for some reason, which I, I kind of get because it says you need to use a stronger verb rather than an adverb. Yeah. yeah. To run quickly, no, to sprint or, you know, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Okay. Um, it says if you've got a bit of a run on sentence or it gives you um, a simpler word to use in, you know, in place of um, say but rather than however or stuff yeah, yeah. like that. Oh, okay. um, so that's really nice to you. So yeah, you want to get a nice low score on that. Um, and another thing is to get somebody else to read it as well. Um, somebody who protect, perhaps um, is not in your niche who you know has no idea. Let's see if you've actually put it into layman's terms. If they can understand it, then great. And you know if they're completely impartial, then even better. Mm. Um, so what was yeah. that app called? The Hemingway app. The Hemingway app. Well, yeah. I mean, I just use it on the browser, but you just type in HemingwayApp.com. Just right. paste in anything on there, and if it all comes up in red or yellow, you know you've done it wrong. Right. So. You're looking for lots of greens, presumably. Is green, is green the colour for go, is it? Uh, oh, no, green might be for adverbs. Basically, you don't want it to highlight anything. If yeah. it hasn't highlighted anything, You're in. happy days. Excellent. <laughs> okay, that's a good little tip, actually. Yeah. I use a, I use a mobile dictation app, um, mm -hmm. not surprisingly, called Dictation. Right. Ooh, and Because um, I can talk quicker than I can type. And mm -hmm. I've now practised quite extensively for quite a lot of emails. I just talk into the app. Yeah. You just press send, you send it to yourself, and mm -hmm. it comes through as an email. You just copy and paste it into the body of an email. Um, it's getting better and quicker, mm -hmm. but you still have a you have a habit when you're talking, and then you see it written down, you go, didn't really mean that. It, yeah. picks, up, it picks up your voice, it picks up your tone, and it, it, it's pretty accurate when it mm. translates over. Occasionally, if you forget to send until later on in the day, it puts a, an odd word that you think, what the hell was I trying to say there? I can't remember because it's, <laughs> it's interpreted what you've said in a, in a. It's a really good way of doing it, but it's mm. also getting practice in terms of how do you dictate and so you've got to say new paragraph rather. If you say paragraph, you just put the word paragraph in, <laughs> okay, and you get a whole, a whole wall of text. But little things, but right. I think there's ways that businesses can be efficient and effective, but it's still yeah. got to read read properly yeah, yeah. and look well. I'm not a big fan of the spell check. I leave it on, but I think spell check again is dangerous because it doesn't have the context of there, no, there, and exactly. there. Does yeah. it it's spelled correctly, but it's out of context. Yeah, so yeah. proofreading is still the, uh, the art that you need to go through. Absolutely, okay. yes, yeah. Um, how many businesses you work with, um, do they have a, a written content strategy? You know, it, we often have, we have a strategy for marketing, we have a strategy for sales development, we have a strategy for leadership, we have a strategy for this. Mm -hmm. Do people overlook a strategy for written content or is that something that's becoming more and more kind of uh, prevalent? Um, I think, yeah, you can do just because like any strategy, it takes a lot of time and effort to, um, to put it together. But um, I think it's still very important. But I think you, with written content, you need to be um, you need to adapt to change because you never know if something, you know, a huge breaking news story or something is going to come along and completely screw up your February content or whatever. Yes. Um, I was doing a piece for an agency in London um, and it was about sort of planning your content strategy and they sort of look at it as, I think it's, pillars and topics so the pillar being digital marketing and the topic being seo or ppc and then mm. um sort of categorizing your content in that way um and then sort of leaving space or something topical for some some sort of reaction piece right and also having more sort of evergreen content that might just sort of answer users questions i mean and again well, like a, a top tips kind of section yeah yeah like basically yeah. you know that's what google wants it wants relevant content that's mm. uh, satisfying the user query basically so i think if you've got a nice mixture of topical and evergreen content you can plan x number of months in mm. advance um and also sort of tie that in with your social media and how you're distributing that on any sort of third party sites linkedin pulse etc i do like the idea of having those little gaps for reactive pieces though yeah because Things happen that mm. you should be commenting on or yeah. or leading the field on or being a thought leader on. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't have those gaps in your content strategy, you miss the opportunity, I guess, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Or you might have something scheduled and that's completely changed by the mm. time that it rolls around. You think, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be a political writer, would you? Because <laughs> you know, ultimately, certainly in the UK, oh, every him. every day, every day, things change. It's a little bit more settled since the. Uh, 
sort of whole Brexit scenario has mm. been sorted. But you know, for, for about three years, if you if you couldn't you couldn't possibly have a content strategy because you didn't know what was happening in the next half hour, did you? Let alone no. what's happening in the next three months, yeah. for example. So, Gosh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, and it does depend on the industry as well. Um, I went to search leads back in June last year, mm. and one thing they said is, okay, it's, it's easy to say, well, you should pay, post two or three blogs per month, but it depends on the pace of your industry, like how mm. often it changes. You might need to be churning out loads of content, or it might be something like dentistry, where I assume that doesn't change that. I was going to say, there were some new <laughs> developments, but the, the yeah. I, I'm assuming the pace of change is slightly less yeah. than, than it would be in, say, artificial intelligence, or mm-hmm. which is evolving on a day-to-day basis, exactly. isn't it, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So would you advocate a written content strategy for businesses who, who would want to take their content seriously then? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. definitely. And like I say, just be open to change, because you never know what's coming around the corner. I'd be interested in understand how many of the listeners for the podcast have got an actual written content strategy because I mm. work with I work with dozens of businesses over each year and I, I, I can't say I've ever come across something that's quite specific to that and I, right, you know, hopefully okay. this will get inspire them to to think about it more than just throwing it lumping it into marketing really you know yeah you've got a marketing strategy boom lump it in there it has yeah. to be a bit different to that because mm-hmm. you're creating content on a on a blog on a social media on yeah. whatever it might be okay yeah. um Let's talk about blogging. I've, I've, I've got a little question. Blogging was as common as sun-dried tomatoes or pulled pork, <laughs> I put in my question piece, really. Okay. It basically, but it, it appears to have gone out of fashion a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, blogging was everywhere. You know, five, six years ago, you have to have a blog. Mm-hmm. And there was all the challenges people had about, you know, well, I've, I've started a blog, but then it's just withered on the vine, literally. Yeah. Um, what's the sort of process in terms of blogging? Is it still relevant? Is it still something that people should be doing and building into their content strategy well i still love a sun dried tomato um okay <laughs> i like a bit of pulled pork to yeah. be fair yeah okay <laughs> vegans might be listening so oh, listen. listen. you know what if vegans don't like pulled pork that's okay they can have the sun dried tomatoes but oh no but they have that jackfruit stuff that tastes just like it i'll tell you what no 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 don't knock it till you've what? tried it Nick. Yeah, okay well let's 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 <laughs> we, we could we could go off on we a massive tangent about, here. i'm sorry yeah, i could veganism. talk about food all veganism. day i apologize exactly um yeah. so blogging. blogging back to blogging yeah um, I think I agree with you and I disagree with you because um, I think the trouble is it's become so easy to do now. My mom could probably set up a WordPress blog right. if she could turn on a computer. Right. Um, you know, so as a result, it's probably become quite oversaturated. And it depends what, what you mean by, by blog. You know, there are people who are just strictly bloggers. Mm. Um, like, you know, travel or fitness might be very oversaturated. Or there are people who just uh, run a particular business and just have a blog um, a sort of a side project. Would that uh, be like a, a daily activity, sort of a dear diary kind of blog? A lot of people do those. Well, of yeah, and stuff. yeah. And I think that's kind of how blogs sort of rose to prominence in the first place. And then actually, people realise, oh no, actually, I need it for SEO. I need to be telling Google that I'm putting out fresh content. But now uh, the requirements are changing a lot more. Um, it's a lot more about um, expertise, authority, and trust. Mm. Um, so actually, positioning yourself um, as an expert. So I think it's not so much. That the blog itself has gone out of fashion. It was just we need to be a bit more creative with it. Um, mm. I think the whole kind of listicle thing is probably on its way out. As much as that's great for um, short attention spans, yeah. um, I think ten things to see in Paris or ten ways to look after your car in winter. Or whatever, you know, I yeah, don't yeah. think you're going to compete to get to the top anymore unless no. it's something really niche or something new, like how to drive my electric car, or, you know, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what, what were those three things? You said authority, um, expertise authority and trust so it starts with expertise yeah and that's about demonstrating that you are because the world's full of experts but then when you <laughs> that's meet the problem yeah when you Ninjas. meet them and you talk to them <laughs> you're sort of wondering where they've got that credential from aren't you really yeah but authority comes i guess from the fact that your content is seen as relevant mm-hmm. what's yeah. the third one trust trust okay and, and that's about building a, a back catalog of followers and people who yeah. prepared to share and, and believe in in what you're sort of yeah uh, and, and from an seo perspective so. yeah if you have links from um a relevant sort of industry body or whatever mm. then google can see actually yeah you you are the real deal sort of thing okay. so yeah in terms of blogging i think we just need to be a little bit more um creative with how we're doing things not just putting out the same content that everybody's doing mm. i mean for example at travel let's say is quite oversaturated but there's someone i follow on twitter who is a plus size travel blogger which is a kind of interesting angle to oh, approach okay. it okay what are um what are the barriers to you 
for whatever reason, what, you know, if you felt judged or whatever in, in, when yeah, you've gone on this travel or whatever. different countries or different yeah. locations or yeah. sites or whatever. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And also I think um, there's a lot more onus on sort of distribution as well. Um, mm. You know, you could be repurposing it for LinkedIn or whatever and, you know, creating a bit more of a discussion and getting mm. a bit more engagement. So it's not just, boom, put a bit of content out and, and hope, you know, build it and they will come. It's just, it's, you know, it's mm. um, it's about generating a conversation, I would say. Do people try and repurpose the same content for different platforms and don't change it then? Is that quite common and it doesn't work? Yeah, it can be. I mean, you see it quite often with like social media scheduling. Um, it's very easy to do something like Hootsuite and go, boom, okay, tweet, Facebook, LinkedIn, boom, send it out. Um, which is fair enough if you haven't got time or whatever, but actually um, people react in very different ways. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I wrote an article on LinkedIn Pulse back mm. in November. It blew up uh, 120,000 people uh, liked it or commented or whatever yeah. um, I don't know why it was just a bit of a rant but thanks um, yeah. um, but then I pasted it again onto medium probably about three people yeah. um, so you know for whatever reason um, people engage with um, content in different ways depending on the medium so I think you need to be really wary of that when you're okay. putting that out there well I, I like to think I post Interesting or relevant content mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. It's probably the biggest platform I yeah. use for my business sort of yeah. uh, 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 pieces, really. Yeah. And yet, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a workshop in the centre of Leeds mm -hmm. uh, on the sixth floor. Okay. And uh, we just about to start the workshop, and a guy dropped down on a gantry um, mm -hmm. on a harness, started washing the windows on mm -hmm. the sixth floor. Sunny day, yeah. overlooking Leeds. And I just took a picture of it, and I posted, what's a workshop host got to do? You know, how do you compete with that? <laughs> and I just put a little piece on there. It would, this is great. You know, wouldn't want his job. He was a bit of a celebrity for. He was waving to the to the workshop. It was yeah. just a little bit of a, a bit of a sort of funny observation. Yeah, thing. sure, sure. That got more views than anything I posted mm -hmm. in 2019. I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> really, <laughs> really. It's just about a guy on a on a harness washing the windows. So there really isn't any logic or rhyme or reason to it, is there? Yeah, I think perhaps with LinkedIn, it's people are sick of all the stuffy content, and again, those motivational quotes <laughs> and stuff like that, and seeing like Oleg and Gary V and all this stuff. Yeah, I yeah. mean, look at the parody accounts, look at Mike uh, Winnie and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. They're all ripping out Bridget yeah. and stuff like that. So actually, it's nice, like we say, the authenticity to just put something out there that's a bit of a giggle mm -hmm. and actually shows you for who you are. Well, it, it, it was an observation on something. Yeah. Else basically saying you know wouldn't want his job and uh you know how, how do i compete with that i'm about yeah. to start a workshop and then suddenly at the back just to, to the right hand side of me unbeknown to me this guy Ooh. drops down in the harness and the, the workshop had <laughs> gone you know i had to wait for him to wash the windows and, and he said, oh, okay i just posted it and i thought oh so just i thought because I, I had a nice photograph that off but yeah. i write a little piece to go with that yeah. astonishing numbers really anyway yeah okay. it just goes to show you never know what could uh, be yeah, a hit it is <laughs> Now, I know that you're, despite the fact that I, I would say that you're sort of a bigger version than this, you're quite a proud freelancer, aren't you? Thank you, I yeah. think you, you, you sort of champion the bit on LinkedIn. I've seen you know, championing freelancers and, mm -hmm. and, and being paid properly and on time and being treated you know, accordingly. So I, I really love that. Yeah. Um, what advice would you offer other freelancers out there, uh, not about written content, but just about being a freelancer in business? And what have you learned from that process? Okay, a few things. First of all, um, well done to you all because it really takes some stones to actually um, leave your job and never know where your next meal's coming from or whatever. So and, and back yourself. Yeah, definitely. And you've got to think it's not just the service you're providing. You've got to be your own accountant, your own BDM, your, your own yeah. marketer. Um, so you've got to wear so many different hats. So well done for going out there um, and you know going it alone. Um, but I would say confidence is a huge issue. Um, I've been to so many events where I see people who've been running their own business for about 10 years and they go, well, no, I'll just turn the work down. If they if they want to, um, you know, negotiate on price, I'll just say no. Or just, no, tell them where to go. And I think it's very well for you, it's all very well for you to say that ten because you've in. been doing it for 10 years. But my goodness, when I was starting out or when I would pitch to people, I'd say, oh, well, I'll charge this, but, but I can go lower if you want. And, you know, and how do you build up that confidence to mm -hmm. say, no, actually, uh, no, this is what I'm worth. Yeah. And this is what I'm charging. And you no, know, because you don't want to turn people away, especially when you're starting out. So, well, you've got bills to pay, haven't you? The yeah. Start. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if that's a sacrifice you have to make in the beginning, don't be ashamed. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in the industry, you know, rate shaming, like, oh my God, I can't believe you're charging such a low rate. But mm. people say, well, you don't know what this person's circumstances are. They could yeah. be a single parent or anything. So don't rate shame. Um, yeah. And then 
as you kind of grow and become more established, you will build that confidence that will come naturally. You'll have a portfolio of work and that will kind of help you conduct yourself when you're meeting new people. Um, and what else? Oh, I've lost my thread now. That's okay. <laughs> I've got well, I, I, I was going to yeah. add to that. I, I'm, yeah. I'm recording a piece uh, shortly, which will go out in mm. the next week or two. Yeah. Uh, it, it is about that kind of um, charge what you're worth uh, mm-hmm. piece. And it, I, I talk about... Um, it's a triangle, really. One is that, uh, creating value for your clients. Yes. That's brilliant. That should always be the end game. Yeah, yeah. Creating value for yourself. Yeah. And then having the, the confidence about the rate shame piece. Yeah. To say that um, psychologically, rate shame has a, a negative impact on you as Absolutely. a freelancer as well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm, I'm putting a piece together, which is just looking at the three strands of that triangle mm-hmm. and saying, you know, how do you maximise that and keep it as an equilateral triangle so all yes. pieces work together. Yeah. So... Um, but I know you're massively passionate about you know, working with, supporting and championing other freelancers. Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah. So There's a really lovely community out there. When I first started out, I had no idea that actually, what, A, there are so many freelancers in Britain, mm-hmm. um, and B, actually how much pe- people are, you know, they're rooting for you. They're all on Twitter or whatever. There are so many hashtags and groups and things you can follow, which is really lovely. And even though they might technically be your competitors, they're actually, they've got your back. No, no, um, one, no one's competing with everybody all the time. No, right? yeah, exactly. Collaboration or just, just sharing or just, just being available to somebody is a good yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and that's another thing I would say um, is go out and meet people. My goodness, like it's so easy for me to sit at home in my pants writing my content or whatever, but <laughs> actually going out and meeting people, you know, it can be quite isolating if you're working from home. So okay. going out and making those human connections really makes all the difference. Quick question. Yeah. Just to finish with a bit of fun. Okay. Do you write better content in your gym jams or in your business clothes? Oh, gosh. Now, one of the tips someone did give me was, no, you need to get up every day and get dressed and have a shower. Oh, I can't be bothered now. What's the point? If Unless I'm on a Skype call. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I'm probably in my gym gear. I'm at active work most of the time yeah. um, because... I think, well, this is my reward. I get to go to the gym. I've yeah. finished this. Okay. So do I write better content? Um, it was only a flippant question. Yeah, I guess, well, no, yeah. pro- probably actually in, in my relaxed wear because I feel more relaxed. I'm yeah. not going to And, and your, your, bra- your brain is not, you know, you're relaxed and creative rather than sort of too uptight, I guess, isn't it? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. We can, we can discuss and debate. There's people, around the, <laughs> there's people around the globe sat there in their sort of uh, uh, homes, that, you know, sat there in the, in the, the pants and vest, <laughs> right? Creating some great stuff. So, yeah, you know, like good say, on you. As long as there's no video in the corner, we're okay. You do you. Katie, that's flown by. That's <laughs> been absolutely fantastic. Quite Thank a few you. gems in there for people to think about in terms of content strategy and, and, and you know what how they need to create their blog content and also you know maximise that exposure of that content across different platforms so yeah. thank you for sharing it's been an absolute pleasure it's been too long but it won't be too long again Absolutely so not, yeah. Katie thanks for coming on the impact sessions thank you very much